invite you. I want to invite you. We want to invite you to be a part of East Lake Sound. Hey. Welcome to the party, everybody. Hey, so I decided not to clean my room today. Can you tell? <laughs> I just blurred it. I was like, no, we're not going to pretty it up today. I do like that hat, though, Rob. I, I, mm -hmm. I've said this to you numerous times. I think you might, you look great in a hat. You're a hat guy. I am a hat guy. I just don't have the budget to be the kind of hat guy I would want to be, so I don't have enough. You have expensive hat taste. I do. I got this for Christmas. It's a lighter like it. version. My favorite hat got eaten by my dog when he was a puppy. It was a black, kind of this style hat that I bought from a guy named Muhammad, real name, from a market in Strasbourg, France in 2017. Whoa. Locked him down to uh, 15 euros. Well, that's pretty good. If I was to confess, weak areas of my life you know how ray says he has a problem with is it shoes it is. Yeah. no no ray does not acknowledge his problem with shoes really he kind of dances around it a little bit because it's a fetish and he yeah that. well my problem is with hats for sure i love hats yeah it's got to be a good hat though that's why i i can't really i don't have the budget no yeah. honest it's really not the shoe thing it's it's it's, it's a little deeper than that it's hoodies. Oh yeah, I have noticed. Yeah, a lot of hoodies. I don't yeah, think I've you ever seen you. You do have some Ray ever worn the same hoodie twice. Probably Ray, not. I don't even know how you're wearing hoodies down here. I have, I have two more coming today. How do you wear hoodies here? I mean, I just look at you in a hoodie and I sweat. The, I I know, I know. I have to, I have to. I, I've convinced myself that when it's fifty degrees or sixty, I can do it. In Missouri, I would have never done it. But here, yeah. I, I look for opportunities to wear a hoodie. I'm one of those people that I will put on a hoodie and then this time of day I take it off and then I can't remember where I left it. Oh, I don't know if you guys have that problem, but. You were wearing a light blue hoodie this morning. I was. I like that color too, guys. It's a it's not black. Carolina blue. I like wearing that color. I was like, ooh, blue, look at me. I feel good today. Somebody look, somebody look. Wow. Philip, I like that color on you, bro. Thanks, man. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Welcome to Second Take at Eastlake, a podcast of Eastlake Community Church in Irmo, South Carolina. You are invited to join us any Sunday at 9 or 11. I got a game for you guys. Oh, <laughs> All right. So this game, it's a classic. It goes way back to the days when you guys were teenagers, probably misbehaving. This was a game that you would sneak away from your parents and you'd be like, you want to play this game? It's called Truth or Dare. Oh, okay. And I know you're scared right now because you're like, how is this going to go? This is super scary because you have bad 15-year-old memories of this game, and it was not good. This is like when somebody said, you're going to have to kiss your neighbor friend or something. Anyway, okay, maybe that's a personal story. But anyways, truth or dare is going to be, this is like an online thing that I found that's safe for corporate people. So if you guys are pretty corporate, these are going to be safe truth or dare Zoom games. Don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to do something illegal or get you in trouble with your parents, okay? So Michelle's mom is okay. All right, you ready for this? So here's the question. Are you guys on this corporate game, I guess, maybe so nobody gets sued? If you don't want to participate, you just have to black out your screen. But uh, you're going to want to participate. And there's only four of us, so, you know, whatever. But you do have the right to refuse service. <laughs> Ray goes away. <laughs> Had to make sure it was working. <laughs> now, here, here's the way this works, though. The truth or dare, like whenever I played this game and whenever I was a bad teenager, they ask you truth or dare and you have to pick. And you're like, oh, my gosh, if if I say dare, they're going to tell me I have to kiss Sally Sue and I don't want to kiss Sally Sue. And if they ask truth, they're going to ask me something really embarrassing. 
This one you don't get to choose. It's just going to pick for us, okay? Are you okay with this, Michelle? What choice do I have? <laughs> Perfect. So, Good answer. Great. All right. Here we go. Truth or dare, it's a button I push on my phone and it pulls it up. Rob is genuinely concerned about what's about to happen. Okay. We'll start with Rob, just because I think he has the most nervous eyes. Show the most interest. This is a this is a dare. Show the most interesting object within arm's reach. You can't leave. You can't leave. I'm looking around. All right. The most interesting object within arm's reach. This was a good safe one to start with. He can't roll over and get his big foot. No, I, oh, that's what he wants to do, but it's got to be. I know he does. Reach. Bigfoot gets more talk on this show than Michelle. Oh. My old, I'm going to make sure the number doesn't show, but my old, previously good, no longer good passport. Oh. With this. Oh, I got to, un- hold on, let me, un- I'm going to show you the, the I'm picture. I'm it, I'm blur it. You got to show us your messy room. Yeah, it's not. Not that bad. That's my Interpol. Um, dude, you look super oh, creepy. My, that dude owns a white <laughs> Econoline van. <laughs> For sure, with no windows. With no windows. No. That dude. So and multiple why. paint jobs and a magnetic uh, license plate. That's why I grew yes. this. After I saw that, oh my God. the day after I saw that picture, I grew this. <laughs> oh, God. Okay, that was good. So far, truth or dare doesn't disappoint. Next up is yeah, Michelle. Right. The day after that picture, I drew. I, I grew this. I grew this coating. <laughs> love it. All right, oh Michelle, God. you're next. Okay. Oh, I love this one. This is a dare. Oh sing, dear. Sing a Christmas carol. We. I am clearing my throat. <laughs> we three kings, we three kings of Orient are oh, she knows it. bearing gifts we traverse afar. Oh, she had a little vibrato in there. Keep going. <laughs> Keep going. You got to sing the whole Something thing. And fountain more in mountain following yonder star. Oh, star of wonder, star of night, star of royal beauty bright. Westward leading, still proceeding, guide us to thy perfect light. <laughs> I I gotta say, I gotta say, Michelle, as much as I like to pick on you, there was a moment in there where your tone had a little vibrato, and I was like, Michelle has a voice on her. I Michelle do. can sing. I haven't <laughs> worked it out very much in a few years, Man. but yes, I can sing. All that. Okay, so next thing we want to know in the comments, should Michelle join the worship team? <laughs> Let us know in the comments, all right? <clears throat> all right, Ray's next up in the hot seat with the truth or dare. The, excuse me, let me push the button. Oh, Ray, this is going to be good. It's the truth. <laughs> this is probably when you met, uh, Sherilyn, your first online username. Don't you lie to me, Ray. My first online username like my was, space. was son of Jarrell. Oh, okay. son of Jarrell. Jarrell. Mm-hmm. Is Jarrell your dad's you name? Was, or is that a biblical you went with a Superman, you went with a Superman theme. You oh. Your- okay, okay. I thought it was going to be like low low and slow or something like that so that was that was even my hotmail account son of jarrell at hotmail.com wow that's good stuff all right this is fun let's keep it was good it was witty (laughs) all right let's keep going rob's next up (laughs) truth your age this one's not that funny probably how old are you rob 61 oh just a spring chicken he's got a lot of spring Bring in his step. I had somebody oh. tell me I don't look a day over 44 the other day, and that made me feel good. There you I go. Had, 44. I had someone guess my age, and they guessed a year older, and I was super disappointed. 
but you know it happens all right here we go um michelle this one's for you oh no okay here we go michelle <laughs> the last movie you watched oh i just watched one it was really good it was on netflix is about a woman who got pregnant as a young lady in and had to give up and went to a convent and had to give up her daughter. It's like Penelope or something like that. Penelope. Penelope, maybe. Penelope. Wow, Michelle, your movies sound lame. Oh, you know what though? I watched one after that. I watched Passing. Is it scary? Not really. It's Does it about, have zombies? No, it's about Ooh. a black woman in the 1920s who yep. um, lives her life as if she's white. And she yep. runs into her friend who is also pretending to be white, but not all the time. Only because she was trying to, I think, go out and buy a toy for her kid that maybe she couldn't get in the neighborhood where yep. she lived. And so the whole story is the tension between um, you know, living in reality and not living in reality. Cause the, the woman who is black and pretending she's white, she keeps going back and forth between the black world and the white world. This officially solves it. I have no question. Michelle is a better person than me. <laughs> Why is that a better person than you? The last movie I watched was like zombies, you know, super shallow, not real meaning for life, like complete. Yes. I just watched. No, I, I don't like those. Yeah, I before that I watched Still Alice about an Alzheimer's patient, but that was oh assigned to me. Michelle, please go do something bad. Go rob a <laughs> bank. Do something bad. Make the rest of us feel better. I, I've used all me. my chips for that already. I don't do anything bad. <laughs> you are killing me over here. Like me and you need to go get tattoos or something. Let's go do okay. something. First rebellion. on the list for pranking us. So oh well, then there there's is that. that. There is that. Whew. Okay, I got another one for Ooh. Ray. This is a good one. This is a dare. Yeah, this is a dare. I could not do this. Spell hypotenuse. Okay. And you guys can spell it online with no no autocorrect. Spell hypotenuse. H Y P E. Wait, wait. So, hold on, I'm gonna write this out. You can write it down. You can write it down. I, I write I don't, it down. Although, if it was a spelling bee, I don't think you could write it down. All right. Is that how you say it? I just looked it up. Yes. H H Y P O T N U S E hypotenuse. H okay, Y P O T E N U S E hypotenuse. I already hit for the next dare on my button. I can't remember how it's actually supposed to be spelled. That is correct because I looked it up. I'm it's, like, oh. what is a hypotenuse? Okay, okay. Congratulations. One job. One job. Used in geometry. Okay. All right. Well, so I, I, you know, to me, it sounds like the name of an art work. <laughs> All right. We got time for one more question. Good and daughter. I'm just going to do, I'm going to do, who, who wants this question? Philip should answer this question. Oh, oh you wanna, okay. You want to know what the question yeah. is? It's a dare. Here comes Spencer. Hang on. You guys can say hi to Spencer. Here's Abby. She's going to get And there's it. Abby. There's Spencer. Get him. Hi, Spencer. Hello. <laughs> um, okay, so this is the dare. Ooh. You guys think I have to do this? We think so. Yeah, you've done okay. that. Show the inside of your refrigerator. <laughs> okay, here we go. All right. <laughs> Moment of truth. Moment of truth. This is my dare. Little trip time. La 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 la. Here we Let's go. See you, Abby. Let's see what we find in here. Oh my gosh, Abby looks terrified. Uh, okay, let's see. <laughs> I feel like this is, all right, we've got Atkins protein shakes, Diet Coke, some clear liquid, water, 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 water. 
In W. Diet root beer. Diet coconut drinks. Fully cooked shredded bacon. Cheese. Green beans. Shredded cheese. Cheese. <sighs> green chili. And a bunch of sauces. This is Nathan's sauce. Sweet heat mustard. And... Oh, the 505, so the 505 That's right. green chili from New Mexico. See? There you go. That's all. This I wish I had something whip. more I fun in here. Well, I'm glad that happened. Look at well, these. The these only... are cool. These are Jimmy Dean's meat lovers. Okay. But we basically just have lick. We just have drinks. That's all we do is we, we don't cook. Sorry. Well, I was going to say, there's not a lot of food in there, Philip. Well, here's some food. Here's some beef pranks and okay. some cheese. I know and who those belong to. And then here's some sausage. Okay. And carrots. There you go. Oh, look at these sausage carrots. Are good. Look at these. I'm going to bring these I don't out. I see any eggs in there, though. You know what? We, had we a haven't customer. gotten an inheritance. Oh, look, 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 look. Bacon. Okay. And eggs, I got to represent for New Hope Homestead, which is Andy and Blair egg Blagg's guy. eggs from our church. I have some of those in my fridge. Yeah. Right. We don't have those right now, but we've had we 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 had some recently. They're gone. But we don't. We honestly don't cook much. There's not a lot of food in there. We drink these drinks. Live on these things. I've had two today. I know that about you. Wow. Was that exciting? Now everybody knows that about you. <laughs> That was awesome. <clears throat> a little anticlimactic, I'm sure. Oh, that was that was not anti. <laughs> uh, if that there was for Rob, we would have a smorgasbord in that refrigerator. My wife, my wife is a cook. Rob's ADD has officially kicked in, which is a sign that we have gone way too far. Rob, let's talk about something worthwhile. I'm sick of this nonsense. Michelle likes this part, so she drags it on forever. But not me. I hate this part. I want to get to the movie. Uh -huh. I'm a deep person with deep thoughts. Um, so in honor of, so this was the last of the series, Love Like That. Rob was teaching. He was in the hot seat. First time using the Pastor 1000. What'd you think yep. of it? Uh, verdict's still out. I felt like I was walking out there with a walker, but that's okay. <laughs> I got to figure it out. I got to get adjusted. <laughs> that's it's an good. adjustment. It's an adjustment. So this one. The last this... time I checked that Michelle preached her best sermon from the Pastor 1000. The last time we did a podcast. <laughs> she that's did. what Philip said. I felt you like did. the Pastor 1000, she like did everything but levitate. Ooh. She might have even levitated, but the Pastor 1000 blocked it so we couldn't see. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say, but no one can see that. Yeah. yeah, man. No, 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 the one thousand is see through, right? Like, <laughs> oh yeah, 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 yeah. Or it's all an optical illusion. Who knows? Well, I got three pastors here with so much wisdom, life experience. That's just like I gotta, I gotta pull them with questions and get their feedback so everybody listening to this can be smarter. I'm ready. Are you guys ready? ready okay so this one was about selflessness and my first question for you is has there been any one in your well it was about self how do you giving. say self-giving 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 self 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 which is giving of yourself yeah for some reason yeah. my new mexico self says selfishness instead of self-giving i don't know if that's the way i grew up hearing it or what but Here's your question. Who has been selfless or who has been self-giving in your life and how has it impacted you? And you guys can type this answer in the comments too, if you want, you can, you can get in on this game, tell a little short story about, show some love to somebody who's shown love to you. And I have a story if you need one while you're thinking, but if you have one, you can go. You want me to go? Of course. Okay. This is really cool. So when me and Kristen were um, relatively newly married, Spencer had just been born. So we were 21 years old. We've been married three years. And I didn't make 
any money. I mean, when we first got married, I, I made $500 a month. And, uh, and I, this church had hired me to lead worship at seven in the morning for a contemporary service. That's because it was not safe to do contemporary services in your church back then. It was very like, yeah. very cutting edge. I attended one of those. We'll do it, but it'll be at seven in the morning. <laughs> it's the persecuted you really church. want it. <laughs> yeah, for the people who, if they really want it, let them come at seven in the morning and wake yep. up their kids because they're young families with tiny kids. Anyways, yep. there was a family in our church that uh, his sister had recently passed away from cancer and she had a home that they inherited through that. And this, um, this man in our church gave us well, he didn't give it to us, but he sold us this house at a 50, at least 50% less than what it was worth. And I believe covered the closing costs because we didn't have any money. We could just make the mortgage. That's so early. cool. And he did that for us. And that literally launched us into it. That changed our life from then on because yeah. we were into the real estate market. And then from then on could buy a home and do different things because that one mm -hmm. guy did that out mm -hmm. of a, and he said, he just said that he wanted to be um, generous. So that was generosity, but he was giving of himself that he could have said, this is mine. This is my money. This is something I inherited. And instead he did that for us. And to this day, our lives are different because of that. His name was Russell Martin. That's awesome. Yay, Russell Martin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, Russ. So I first thought about one of those, a person outside, and then I actually decided based on just, I've been having a lot of meetings with people lately to just help married couples just work through stuff. Just a lot of them, so many. And it's, it's, it's had me in a place where I will say that the most self-giving person I have ever met is my wife. Hmm. Because at the time when she had every right to leave me as you know my story when i really dropped it bad uh, went back to drinking and and gotten you know let all of the addictions come back for a season um when she had every right and probably sane had every sane reason to walk away she chose to stay because these were her words at the time because the better you is really there uh, not giving up and I wasn't sure I believed that at the time. Um, wow. So for me, that was probably the most selfless act I've ever seen in the year 2000, 23 years ago, my wife could have been free of a lot of pain, hmm. but decided that we mattered more and that we needed to stay together. And I think that was one of the most selfless acts. Everybody was telling her to leave, uh -huh. almost including me. Wow. And like, nope. Nope, I know who you really are, and I'm here. That was very selfless of her. Yay, just Jenny. Continue. That's continued day in and day out. Just it's amazing. Yeah. Anybody else? So the story I'm thinking of is not like a big story. One of the things that I said in teaching team that I thought was really helpful was Rob talked about the fact that you can just do simple things to be selfless. Mm -hmm. um, and so this made an impression on me as a young woman. Um, I have family that lives in Chicago, my uncle David and my aunt Marie. And, um, you know, they've been urban missionaries. They've never had, you know, tons of money or anything like that. And they live on what people send them because they raise your own funds doing that. And I was in her house as a young woman and I admired a scarf and she gave it to me mm. and she really loved the scarf, but she loved me more. And it made such an impression on me that that's how she lived her life, like really open-handed like that. Mm. And so if somebody needed something and she had it, she just never hesitated. Or even if they didn't need it, they just liked it or admired it. You had to be careful not to say these things to Aunt Marie because she would give you those things. <laughs> and so I think sometimes we think selfless has to be big, but mm -hmm. the, it's cool to me that she was known for that. Like, be careful. Like, yeah. that's a reputation to have. 
You better really want it because you're getting it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I've had lots of selfless people in my life. I mean, my mom, my aunt, my, you know, all those things, but those are big stories. But this is a, just a small story that made a real impression on me. Yeah. That's cool. Mine, was, mine is a simple one as well, um, Pastor Michelle. Mine is my mom. I mean, just a legacy of selflessness. Um, how she treated, if you want to know where I got my desire and earthly drive to love people well is from my mom. That's so cool. Just watching her do it, loving, being able to love people that she employed. And even when they did her wrong and she had to let them go because of what they did, but still have a relationship with them long after that uh -huh. and then feel safe with her. Uh -huh. You know, that's, that's to me, that's, that's the epitome of mm -hmm. loving people well. Mm -hmm. And so I, I hope to be able to do it half as good as she does or did. Well, no, do, she does because she's still alive. Thank God. So, yeah. Yeah. That's cool. I'm, I'm curious I was, when Rob was teaching on Sunday, I was thinking about like, um, common struggles or, or struggles in culture and one of the big ones that I, I i would say it's at the top of the list is depression anxiety things that many many people currently um are battling or are working through and i was curious does self does self giving help with that is is there is there a Coral is is that like an antidote for depression, anxiety to be selfless? Um, I, I'm curious. I'm genuinely curious uh, if you guys see anything there. Let me speak as somebody who has been open about my struggles with depression that come from a lot of my, the trauma and the things that I've shared that led to some of my downfall. You know, 20 plus years ago. Yeah. Um, tricky answer because the answer is yes and no. Because depression is this insidious little thing that can come out of nowhere, especially if it's clinical. Mm -hmm. So, but the answer to your, the simple answer to your question is yes, because it puts you in the right perspective um, of what matters the most. And what matters the most is that God puts you on this earth to bless other people. Mm -hmm. And so that doesn't take away your value. So, so that's why I'm being very careful in how I answer this, because sometimes yeah. I think in the midst of depression, it can almost feel like giving of yourself, you don't even have that in you because you might not. I mean, you might be so mm -hmm. down on you that you've got to have God redirect who you are to yourself. But I can tell you, when I get into seasons of giving well with balance and health, meaning I give as God tells me to give and, and withdrawal uh -huh. as God tells me to withdraw, those are the best seasons of my life in terms of the depression bug, quote unquote, mm -hmm. Um, not be able to take over. So I think it, as far as anxiety goes, I think you're a lot less anxious when you realize you never owned any of the things anyway. So your calendar's not yours, your money's not yours, your things are not yours. So I think the short answer is yes. With a little touch there, you know, that sometimes with clinical depression, there's nothing you can do to help you with that, uh, except yeah. to follow your doctor's orders, take your medication and do the things that you're told to do. But when you're on that medication, if you give a little bit of yourself, I think you're going to find you're finding more value in why you're up that day and what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. That might be, but I wanted to be careful with that one. Yeah, you do have to be careful. I know I kind of threw that big, deep question out there, but it, it I am a hundred percent sure that somebody listening to this is, is battling through that right now. And for, I don't. So on the other end, I, I, I mean, I am really annoying. I have a friend that that really struggles with anxiety and we love each other, but he's like, you you are killing me, but also I love hanging around with you because you don't have anxiety and I have so much for the both of us. And so we're kind of like peanut butter and jelly. We're best friends. We need each other, but he's like, I just don't get it. And I've had this conversation with him of, you know, when I wake up, my, my first thought it, is not about what my body needs or what I need or whatever, you know, and his first thought is, how do I feel? What's my headspace? You know, it's very internalizing. And, uh, and I know that that's a clinical thing. So I'm not trying to say shame on you for feeling that way. But I'm just curious, if there was a way to like, 
shift that focus out from self self emotions into other people's needs if that's helpful or anything do you, any of you guys have any experience with that i know we're not doctors let's say that clearly although i joke about it i'm not a doctor um but any any experience with that or any thoughts there or, there doesn't have to be i think anytime you can get your thoughts um, away from ruminating on your own situation um, mm -hmm. you know whether it's depression or you know you could just be walking through grief and you need to grieve I'm not saying don't grieve but there's a difference between being in a situation in life that's difficult and just being consumed with that 24 7 or kind of getting out of of that headspace and a lot of times a good way to do that is to serve somebody else because if you do that then you find you can come back to your own problems in a better space you know mm -hmm. so i think there is a certain um amount of self-discipline in learning how to get outside yourself mm -hmm. that's good yeah. i mean you want to know why um pastors walk away from the job mm -hmm is because their focus is on the wrong thing and so in in our job that you know is multifaceted in what we're responsible for if we focus on the problems of the people that bring their problems to us more than we focus on the lord it becomes overwhelming very fast mm, that's true it does it's, it's not that we don't think about the people or their problems it's just that we don't allow what we think about people and their problems to take precedence over our time, our personal devotion and time with the Lord. Mm -hmm. So whether you're a pastor or not, what you focus on tends to grow mm -hmm. or becomes magnified. At least it does in your head. And so we need to be very careful about those things that we invest massive amounts of our brain thought space with. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, and I do think, you know, in Rob's sermon, when he was talking about things you can do, like, mm -hmm. you know, just pay attention to what your spouse needs. And just, and so being selfless um, or self-giving in a healthy way is, is a muscle you can grow, you mm -hmm. know? So if you're a person who is usually self-focused, and you start, you know, every day trying to do something for somebody else, you might find that you make some relationships that you've had a hard time making. Um, because nobody wants to be around someone who never asks about them, doesn't care about them. Um, you know, so learning to grow in this impacts so many areas of your life, your work, your relationships, all of that. Mm -hmm. That's good. Well, on about what you just said, Michelle, and also what you said, Ray, um, is where the focus is, it's not on the big moments. I think sometimes we think if I'm going to be self-giving, I've got to be like Jesus and, and, and have a crowd around me that I'm attending to and I'm caring about. And, and the reality is self-giving starts honestly with you in the space that you're in the most, mm -hmm. so whatever that is. So college, your dorm room with your, with your dorm mate, um, married couple, your spouse, um, roommates as adults, whatever, bus mates on the bus on the way to school. Um, carpool drivers, all of those things. That's really where the self, the self giving starts, which when we're submitted to Jesus, we're attentive, we're, we're attentive to who it is around us that we're to be self giving with. And mm -hmm. if, until there's a big crowd in front of us, we will never have a chance to be self giving to a crowd because we've never been mm -hmm. self giving to the people that God has already given us. Mm -hmm. Not that the crowd mm -hmm. is not the goal. But I just see too many people are like, well, once I have a crowd or I have an audience, I can be self-giving. It's like, no, no, be self-giving right now. Mm -hmm. And then that changes mm -hmm. your mind because you're at Jesus' feet. And so back to your original question, almost a question and a half ago, when I live a self-giving lifestyle, when depression hits, the road to recovery is fast. Mm -hmm. I have the anchor of Jesus reminding me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm himself to me so that I could give to others without damaging myself. Don't mishear me without destroying myself. He's going to lift me up. Mm -hmm. That's good. You know, on the, uh, 
one of the things that that you were discussing this was where Jesus was washing the disciples feet wash Judas's feet and it's it's interesting to me I mean this is kind of along the anxiety line it is very much along the anxiety line mm -hmm. Jesus was human there's no way he saw and knew what he was walking into and did not have anxiety there's no way right concern anxiety uh, you know just like uh, you know and yeah. and he kn he knew where his life was going to eventually end up and mm -hmm. yet live this life of service i don't know i just i just see the the relation is very interesting to me mm -hmm. um and i'm not saying it's a cure-all that's i'm just i'm just saying it's interesting um it's just very interesting to me so mm -hmm. yeah and, and i don't know I, I have, I feel like we have to discuss a little bit about like, even Jesus washed Judas's feet, right? I mean, that is, I don't, my, I don't, I literally don't think my brain can comprehend that. I mean, I could do that spitefully, but I don't know that I could do that authentically, <laughs> you know? And so I was just curious if you guys ever had any experience where you've had to do that or you know, be there for other people or any advice for people who are struggling to do that. I think the most difficult people to love are the, are the real, are the real um, benefactors of love. If you can get over the hump and you can serve those people, there's just so much reward there, but wow, it's difficult. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, you know, I don't think any of us have had to serve the person who was plotting to kill us so <laughs> it might feel that way <laughs> it might feel that way sometimes but i mean not literally i mean so it's hard for me to compare myself to jesus but there have been times that i have been called to love people who were unkind to me and who hurt me um but i think the most important thing there is you have to do that in the power god gives you um, yeah. God met Jesus and empowered him in his humanness to do this thing. And if you try to serve somebody who's wounded you and God's not called you to it, I mean, that's probably called codependent. <laughs> but if God's called you to it, then, you know, he's in it and doing something. So I think the most important thing there is knowing, you know, is God really in this and my doing this? Eve you know, herself, she's so smart. Yeah, but I'm going to flip this, and, and this is, I could not go there on Sunday as far as I would have wanted to because of the reality of all the, what I had to cover, but I think we forget that we are really Judas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Peter at the best case scenario in terms of... Amen. And, and I think that once I realize that I'm probably more often than I want to admit sitting in Judas's seat, Mm. Yes. Mm -hmm. the yes. Person that I consider yes. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My... now it comes easier. Unlike Jesus, who was all man but was all God, so the Holy Spirit was was there in such a way that it was. I think it was probably pretty easy for him to watch to wash Jesus' feet because he was so in tune with the Spirit in him. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know that I'm very often in tuned enough to love every minute of when God calls me to hey go love that one over there. Uh -huh. Thanks, God. Yeah, I know. Yeah. He said, so go love him. Uh, uh -huh. um. Yeah, that's good. Love that. We are Judas. We and we we really need to embrace that. Uh -huh. We need to embrace the fact that just like Judas, he invites us to follow him. We need to embrace the fact that just like Judas, we follow Jesus with our own agendas. Uh huh. We also need to embrace the fact that, like Rob pointed out, Judas got to eat too, and Judas got his feet washed, and we uh -huh. get to eat. He provides for us every uh -huh. day. He lavishes us with people that serve us when we really don't need to be served, but we need to be the one serving. And he is kind and gracious towards us, and he does this too. Even when Judas comes up, and kisses him to signal to the authorities that he's the one. 
Jesus does something extremely odd. He calls him friend. He makes friendship available to us as well. Mm. That's wild. Yeah. And one more thing, how we act like Judas. We seek approval and forgiveness from other people before we go to Christ and ask for forgiveness from him. Mm. Mm-hmm. It's true. Judas tried to get right. He tried to repent by going back to the people that paid him to betray Jesus. They threw the money back at him. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, we, we, we have way more in common with Judas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I wanted to, this is such an interesting topic because we all think we get it. Like, and I'm just being honest, like not that we, I don't think everybody thinks they're good at it, but we get the concept of selflessness, of self giving, of being generous. We get that concept. So when I bring it up, it's like, okay, whatever. Right. I've heard this, but the question to me is how do we put it into action? And how do we actually make those changes of becoming like that in our lives? And I'm bringing this up because we had a really interesting discussion this week in our staff meeting. And I think we can, I'm really lobbing this out there, but I think that this is an interesting topic that people can handle and would like to be, would like to hear about. One of the biggest struggles, I'm going to go there, okay? One of the biggest struggles we have with our community partners is that we cannot find people to serve them like you would think we can, okay? this I can cut this if you guys want me to, but I wanna talk about it a little bit. So let's just see where it lands. And here's what I'm trying to say, listeners, okay? We have community partners that everybody in our church feels led to serve and to be there for. We want to help people like Reconciliation Ministries, like, um, Name some of them. I just went blank because I'm talking too much. But uh, Providence Home, Providence, we care. care, sharing God's love, all these different things. We have these ministries that we partner with. We also, as a church, have gone through something called um, uh, when, helping when helping hurts. So here we are as a church, as a staff, as believers, as a community. We want to do something to help our partners. At the same time, we've learned we don't want to just do a serve day to make us feel good, but make more work for them. We don't want to do the thing where we show up on a Saturday and we say, we're all here with our matching t-shirts, ready to serve. We care. And we care is like, thank you, but we needed you on Thursday. And now today we had to come in on an extra day and make up work for you guys to do. And thank you, but no thank you. When helping hurts, that's the concept. We don't want to be like that. Mm-hmm. As a church, we struggle to get our disciples to connect with our care partners, with the partners that we care for, in a way that is genuinely, truly helpful. And I just bring that up because we can't come off of a sermon series and about loving like that. We can't come off of a sermon about self-giving and not discuss how what is our dream scenario? What is the goal? When do we feel like we've hit the target and we're loving our partners, we're doing ministry, we're not hurting our partners, and we're growing as disciples? Like what if we if you guys could just be you could just speak it into existence, what would you speak as as leaders of East Lake? And I know it's people and we're all human, we're all Judases, we're all these things. What would you just speak and have happen? I'm getting real, huh? I'm just... You know what I would say? I would say that I wished more that people would actually pray and then do whatever Jesus said to do. Because here's the thing. Serving is sometimes not convenient or comfortable. Mm. And so if what the partner needs is for people to show up on name the day and 
you thought enough of them and you also considered praying about this, that Jesus told you, I want you to take your lunch break and I need you to show up at that you would make that sacrifice. Mm -hmm. I understand something. So for, for people that might think that I'm coming at this from, from the, the seat of a pastor, I was employed in corporate America for over 20 years of my life before I became a pastor. And so I understand that even if I wanted to attend my son or daughter's field trip at school, I had to take off work. I had to sacrifice either staying late at work that day or sacrifice vacation time. But my children were worth it. Hmm. Ask yourself this. Are you following Jesus close enough that if he asked you to take two hours of vacation time to give to, to serve with, would you do it? Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that when, when I was doing men's ministry stuff, I would say we're going to take Thursday, Friday, and Saturday to go to a men's retreat. And people would say, Ray, you're asking people to take off Thursday or half a day of work and Friday off to, to, to go on a retreat. And I said, I sure am. And you know why? Because here's what I also know. It's not good for our church to be left without all of its men that actually are the servers in the church. For us to be gone on a Sunday morning, what does that do to the rest of the body? So I'm asking men to sacrifice a day and a half of vacation time so that spiritually they can connect to God and disconnect from their daily grind so they can get filled. Mm -hmm. Those that saw it as a high value, they took off. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would say. <laughs> you know, I think if I could sum it up, Philip, it's, it's what Ray said, but here it is in a couple of sentences. I would love for us as leaders of the church to be able to make needs known and know that people are attuned to Jesus to know if they're the one that's supposed to raise their hand. Hmm. And not feel guilty if they're not. It's not it's Jesus. It's so. not guilty. But, yeah. But to maybe feel a little guilty if they <laughs> said no without asking Jesus. Mm -hmm. like, Jesus tell them no and feel completely good with that. And it's totally yeah. fine. And it's mm -hmm. totally 100%. Because we trust that Jesus knows the workers that need to be in the different places. So in my world, it would be ask Jesus. We put a bunch of needs out there because we're a good communication hub. And people go as Jesus tells them. But like Ray said, they got to be asking Jesus and be willing to be uncomfortable or potentially moved out of their comfort zone or have it cost them something. Because what Jesus did for me cost him everything. So if it costs a little something and he calls me to do it, I'm going to do it. If it costs something and somebody's trying to strong arm me into it, I'm not spending the money or the time. But if mm -hmm. Jesus tells me to do it, I'm in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you think, Michelle? You've wrestled with this for a long time. <laughs> you know, I think that um, it is particularly hard in wealthy countries and areas to make time to be a disciple because there are so many options and so many things that we can do with our time. And I agree, it cannot be shame-based. I don't ever wanna shame anyone. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, I do wanna call people into something different. Mm -hmm. um, and different might be limiting some of the things that the culture sees as normal. So you can do something that's a little abnormal, mm -hmm. um, but fills you in a different way when you're following Jesus to do that. And so, you know, I would just encourage people to really let Jesus stretch them and really ask, you know, what is the life of a disciple look like? How do I live an integrated life? Hmm. That I'm not going to church on Sundays and getting my ticket punched and then not living with Jesus directing me all through the week. Mm -hmm. And 
it's countercultural to make time in your life to be a disciple, whatever that looks like. Um, but I think it's the most satisfying thing that you can do. Mm -hmm. And so I just wish people would do it because I think they would find that their life would be fulfilling and mm -hmm. meaningful. Mm -hmm. sure. One of the, this to me from my seat is like a moving target that requires dedication and emphasis. And, and what I mean when I say that is the needs change. They're never the same. There's not a schedule. Like as our partners are on the front lines. So one of the best things we can do is to be their backup, to be their encouragement, be their help when they need it. So that's what we want to do. But it's really easy for us to just say, March 11th, we're going to go and do a serve day and everybody in, in East Lake checks the box. I did the serve day. They gave me a t-shirt. I got my kids involved. They took great Instagram photos. We were at all these places. I love my church, hashtag blessed. And it's like, that is not good. And, but that does, that does make people happy. People love that because it does all the, it checks, it scratches all the itches. But what really needs to happen, the moving target that I don't know, I'm not saying that I'm good at at all, but the moving target is living in relationship with the partners to the point that you know, oh, Thursday, they're getting a shipment of groceries in. Um, I got a buddy at work. We could probably take an extra hour at lunch and slip over there and help them. That's a relational partnership moving. So the moving target also is us being able to communicate to our church the needs Yep. and to be on that fast quick response it, it takes a desire and a passion to literally partner with our partners partner. not to just put them on our website and these are these are our partners but to really partner with our partners and guys church i'm telling you listeners of this podcast it's hard i know it's hard for you as listeners it's hard for us as staff to get the info to you at the right time to do a good job it is a moving target, but I think that it's something that needs to have a spotlight shined on it at least. And just even if what we say is, hey, we're we're getting close to the target. We're trying to hit the target here with this spotlight, but help us partner with our partners. Listen to God is what is what these guys are saying, you know, and at least let's not just check a box and feel good about ourselves or say, why doesn't my church do a survey and give me a T-shirt? I don't like East Lake. I'm going down the road like. Let's use our brains, people, and try to and try to do this well. <laughs> Sorry, am I being too honest? <laughs> but to try to do it well. Um, so yeah, did I push too hard? <laughs> I'm usually the grace one and raise the one that pushes too hard. <laughs> Let's use our brains. <laughs> I give you my hammer, sir. <laughs> I'm not even by saying this, I am at the front of the line of failures in this area. I don't get this right all the time. So I'm not saying or shaming. I'm just, it's a, it is a, it is a, a something that deserves emphasis. Mm -hmm. I'll say that. And it requires, it's at least moving in a direction towards it. So, all right. Mm -hmm. I, I lit the fire with that one, but oh. I, I thought it was good. We can't, we can't dodge that. We have to talk about it. Um, is there anything else that you guys thought, you know, as you're, as you're wrapping up the series, was there anything that you loved or you just wanted to have a final comment on we will love like that before we say goodbye? I'll give you yes. Oh, go ahead, Michelle. Okay. Read the conclusion and the appendix. Yes. Yes. Because that appendix, I got more underlined in the appendix than some of the chapters and they were all good. Wow. But if you want to live a spirit directed life a christ-centered life there are some great ideas and helps in there in in those two areas i was going to say remember what i said at the end of my message to try to close put a bow on this whole series um loving like jesus isn't achieved it is received when we surrender to the work of the holy spirit so all of these things we've talked about in our own power will not happen we will not be mindful we will not or, or we'll have some perverted version of it at the very best when we submit to the spirit 
we begin to receive the ability to be graceful, to be bold, to be self-giving, to be mindful, um, and to be approachable. And so it's, it's all about the Holy Spirit, not us earning some awesome score on this test. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I would give this as an encouragement um, because somebody did this literally two weeks ago because I wasn't here last week. I was in Michigan. They went out and bought the book after the sermon on being bold. It's not too late. Right. If, if you have balked at buying the book or reading, please pick it up. It's an easy, delightful, and challenging read, but you'll be the better if you actually read through it and, uh, and begin to apply it to your life. Amen. Yeah. Including the conclusion and the appendix, as Michelle said. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. You guys are awesome. I genuinely love hearing all of your insight on all of this. Um, it's my favorite. It really is. I like this. I learn in this type of environment. So thanks for input, inputting. Um, let me um, just give you guys one final chance. Any Anything coming up? We already talked about Celebrate Experience. Big game is this Sunday. What time do they get there, guys? 5.30? Well, they have to have if they're competing. They have to have their stuff on the table by five thirty. Okay. If it says, on that, it says right in an email. Once they sign up, they get a thing. Make sure you get there by five thirty if you're competing. Yeah. I think it's yeah. open at six for the general public to bring their food in and put it on the tables in the lobby. Okay. Anybody can come. It's a blast, and it's a lot of fun. So come check it out. Um, and I think that's all. So we'll sign up because we're running out of time, but we'll see you guys later. Hey. <laughs> East Lake Community Church is an intentional, multicultural community empowered by the Holy Spirit. We passionately pursue a loving relationship with God and everyone Jesus was sent to die for here, near, and far.